I'm Alexis Penny, uh, Jordan Neighborhood Resident here in North Minneapolis. I'm also a member of the Above the Falls Community Advisory Committee here to talk about the Above the Falls Regional Park Master Plan. Great. So we're going to, I'm going to start and do a little bit of history and context um, regarding the city's plans, which I think are important because we tend to, in some of these different meetings around the city and right now the Upper Harbor Terminal, tend to focus on small pieces, and which is important. We also want to look at the big pieces and the history. So back, I have to read this. Back in 1883, uh, Cleveland recommended public acquisition of the Minneapolis Riverfront above above Plymouth. We call Plymouth, above Plymouth is above the falls. It's not, well, it's more than above the falls, but that's the upper river in Minneapolis. Um, and in Minneapolis, there's a very unique situation that many, if not all of you, already know about. But I will repeat it. And that is every single body of water. Rivers, lakes, creeks, ponds are public. The, the, the shoreline is public. And usually it's water, green space, bike and hiking trails, a little more green space, and then private property. And that is a very unique um, plan, and it, it's a social justice issue. It's for community ownership of the rivers and the lakes and the, and the land around them so that we can have access and enjoy them. And no one, no matter how much money they have, can have shorefront. They're not going to buy the land right up to the river or the lake. And if you go just north of here, it's a house for sale right now in Brooklyn Park that has 70 feet of Mississippi River shoreline. Can't do that in Minneapolis. But you'll know, and they don't have the whole system here, but you'll notice this is South Minneapolis, downtown, north and northeast. This is the only area of the city where this is not true. And it was first recommended to complete the plan in 1883. So we've been working on this for a really long time. The other piece that fits in here is the Grand Rapids, which includes driving, walking, walking not so much, but and biking. Again, the whole city around all the lakes and the river have trails on both sides, on the St. Paul side as well. They've now completed this, or it's almost completed. It's just north and northeast where we don't have this access to the river. So we um, don't have the ability to get on our bikes or for walkers, go outside our house within a few blocks, get on the trail, and go wherever we want to go. So it's kind of sad. So as you go along, oh, I'm going to go fairly quickly. In 1885, they acquired Riverside Park. In 1887, Minnehaha Park. In 1893, East River Road was completed to Franklin Avenue. 1905, West River Parkway. 1908, Little More of East River. In 1973, the plan of Minneapolis proposed what the Above the Falls plan proposes. So that was the second time they came in and said, oh, we got this plan. Did not get implemented. Then um, the Ford Lock and Dam was completed in 1917. Milling declined at St. Anthony Falls. The West River Parkway was acquired. Water power is abandoned at St. Anthony Falls. The Upper Falls lock opens in 1963. And this is really significant because that's what destroyed Spirit Island, which is a sacred place for the Native Americans. Also um, uh, made the downtown area very industrial. And from the day it was opened, it lost money for the city. So it was a mistake from the very beginning. And if you notice, um, it's not even on this map, but in 20, 2015, it was closed. And a number of environmentalists and neighborhood people worked to close the upper lock and dam for a number of reasons. In 2000, I think it was, the taxpayers for common sense came here. They had the 10 projects in the United States that lost the most federal money, and that was one of those, number three, I think. So huge issue for a lot of people. But we weren't making any traction until the Asian carp came in. And the Asian carp, it's a long story, but they were released down in Texas, I think, and um, were really disrupting the ecosystem. And the only way to stop them from going into northern Minnesota and Canada and wreaking havoc with um, fishing people, resorts, let alone the ecosystem. And so that's what closed the upper lock and dam was the car, not anything else. But it ended up being a good thing. 
Um, there's still plans right now of possibly taking the lock and dam out. Who knows? Weirder things have happened. But right now, people are kind of working around it. But So that was a huge piece for this part of the upper river. It so put in, didn't work. Now it's shut down. May at some point be taken out. Um, I was going to say something. Oh, and that's what also led to the development of the Upper Harbor Terminal, because the Upper Harbor Terminal received very little, but some shipping that stopped when the lock and dam was closed. And so the city had been talking about closing down the harbor, which is really a glorified term for really nothing, <coughs> storage and one, one little tugboat. But um, when the lock and dam closed, it didn't make sense to keep it open any longer. So that also pushed the closing of the Upper Harbor Terminal which led to that whole big project. So kind of cool stuff. I'm going to back up. In 1972, there's a plan called Mississippi Minneapolis. This is the third plan to develop this area that also didn't go anywhere. But I was on that committee. It was revived in the late 80s, early 90s. And believe it or not, one of the co-chairs of that committee was John Isaacs. You all know who John Isaacs is? Remind us. He's the one of the owners of American Iron. And so you have to wonder why he was on that committee. I don't know. Kind of like Graco being on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The other chair was Michael Rainville from North Minneapolis, who works with um, Meet Minneapolis. Meet Minneapolis. Um, that didn't go very far, but as that committee was meeting, that's when the Above the Falls uh, project came in. Um, in 1983, the Park Board did a plan for Nicollet Island. 1984, River Place in St. Anthony, Maine were completed, um, and they were ahead of their time. Many people, are people familiar with that project? They, there's a lot of restaurants and stores and bringing attention to the cobblestone streets and the, and the trails along the river, um, but it was financially unsuccessful. So now it's mostly businesses, um, office space. And there's still some restaurants, and actually, I think it's coming back a little bit. A lot of people say that was ahead of its time. That was in the early, mid 80s. Um, and then the Whitney Mill was renovated. The West River Parkway came from Portland up to Plymouth. It's getting closer, getting closer. <laughs> um, the Storm Arch Bridge was opened in 1994. I don't even know what that one is. The Federal Reserve Bank opened in 1997 on the west end of the Hennepin Avenue Bridge, and we were talking because I'm a lot older than some people in this room. And I remember when there was a train station there. How many people remember the Great Northern Train Station? So that was torn down in, in a project of urban renewal, and the um, Federal Reserve Bank went into that spot. So some changes. And then in 1998, West River Parkway from Forest Street to Portland up to Plymouth. 1999, the above the falls fire. So there was about five years of community meetings. Many of them were over 100 people. People were out in the, in the park. They couldn't get in the park building. They were out on the grass listening or watching um, through um, video, whatever. Um, a lot of the meetings were very contentious, but they were big and, and they're north and northeast. Um, a lot of newspaper coverage. And so in 2000, this is not, this is a, an update, but a plan was published that looks something like this. It was adopted by the city of Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, and the um, Hennepin County. So it is an approved plan. In 2013, there, there is another revision, which has not been approved yet because we're waiting for the park alignment at the Upper Harbor Terminal for it to be finally approved, and then it has to go to the Met Council for any changes. But it hasn't really changed. It's the same basic plan since 2000. Well, well some, some changes, though, Mary. For yeah, example, well, like uh, uh, in 2013, there was this design competition that took place uh, at the same time the city of Minneapolis is uh, going forward with uh, reviewing uh, the, con the, the master plan. And the city council did adopt it in 2013, but the design the concept um, uh, contest that happens in 2013. There is like a, a winner that comes out of this, and the winner I, I don't know the exact name of the winner. I should have probably actually researched that. But they were a design Tom group. Tom Leader. There's a Tom Leaders group that designed essentially a wetland proposal for for this site. But as you guys know, that a lot of times uh, plans sometimes just get you know they're just like 
written in a book and then they go on a shelf so they don't necessarily get implemented and so even so after that you also see in terms of like the zoning what was going to be allowed on that site was going to be like a business park and then only more recently i would say probably in uh 2015 2016 you start seeing people start to agree that maybe the market feasibility studies and analysis that they've done in, in this area will allow them to start building commercial retail and housing because at one time i think the city was adamantly opposed to is saying that there's going to be housing on the on these sites particularly right now where they're proposing it um, on the 48 acres of harbor terminal, terminal site uh, most recently uh, placing it right next to the riverfront um, kind of some things things that we heard most recently out of these conversations from the national park service is that housing that close to the riverfront would be detrimental to the site and i think they're actually proposing more open space and more uh, public space for, for that park particular parcel and so I think that it would be it would behoove us all to really pay attention uh, to what's happening in these planning processes with the city, because essentially they are moving forward to, to move uh, to have a, a development there that probably will not provide the best use uh, and definitely not as great of a uh, public benefit um, when you're going to develop it privately. Um, and just one comment that people may agree or disagree. I mean, we're not trying to, you know, create agreement here, just discussion. So in reviewing the above the falls plan. From Clement to the city limits, the plan was to um, add a thousand units of housing. Right now, at the Upper Harbor Terminal, there are people proposing 700 units of housing just in this little park. Upwards of 800, actually. So that's going to be incredibly dense. And I'm not sure, as Alexis is saying, I'm not sure that's the best, especially when it goes all the way down to the river. This area is also part of the critical area for the river. And so there are limits for heights and setbacks and things like that. And to put the housing in what they're calling parcel one, which is right near the river, there's another section farther up, would would require um, variances and, and so word, additional use permit. Additional use, which a lot of us working on the river would oppose because they're there for a reason. We want the river to be healthy, the animals, the plants, and us. We need to have some, some space and some some ability to, to enjoy the, the plants and the water and, and those kinds of things. So and just cram all the development all the way to the, to the edge. It, it and one thing I forgot to mention, I know most of you guys in the room are very familiar with this. Um, in the 2013 uh, master plan that was brought forward uh, at, our, at our Upper Harbor site, they had initially proposed about 28 acres worth of parkland, public park space that would be located there. More recently with, its, with the concept plan that was approved in March, the reduction of that space uh, from, from about uh, 28 to 19 and a half, a 30 percent re reduction in public space is now kind of what they're proposing. Uh, they have there have been some shifts in the concept plan in terms of like where they want to place the music venue uh, and also in terms of um, where they're what Mary and I just discussed in terms of personal one and where they'd like to place housing. And there's some other considerations because they always talk about like public benefit and how uh, we could potentially have a utility hub a public utility hub there located at the site however in terms of what that could be and how it would benefit community in terms of being uh green jobs and activation activated spot for people to have better sustainable environmental kind of use practices and urban agricultural uh, uh strategies at that site no one's really like said how we're going to do that who's going to finance it who's going to own it i'm sure people like um mississippi mushroom uh ian for example would really like to be a part of the conversation i'm sure he has to some degree but these are the kind of con uh, the kind of considerations I think that are really important. And if you look at the map, look at the large green spaces here down by Minnehaha and along here, and how narrow it is up here. By the way, this no one. longer goes back that far. So there's a little bit, a uh, little bit more over at Marshall Terrace Park. That's why. But most of this is set up to be very narrow. And if you looked at Lake Harriet, which is over here somewhere, <laughs> they, there's a lot of green space in the Minnehaha Park. So it's not always going to be equal, but we want to look at getting some of that green space in this area up here. And I also want to point out, when we started this project in 2000, between Plymouth and the city limits, 20% of the land was in public ownership. We are now at 80%. Thank you. 80% of this land is in public ownership. So this, some of this is darker green already. Um, the Upper Harbor Terminal is a big piece. But um, the last 20% is going to be the hardest because those are the pieces like GAF that are difficult to, to move. And 
Um, the park board is not buying land aggressively. They're not using eminent domain, the, except there was an exception over at Great Hall, but um, which ended up, I think, being negotiated instead. But they're making offer. They're trying to get in as um, what do they call it? first 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 right of first, first right of refusal. Yeah. And the trust for public land is working closely with the park board to do that. So they talk to homeowners and say, if and when you sell. Can you give us the first shot? And a lot of people say sure. And sometimes they even sell stuff cheaper because they want to donate it or, or whatever. So just so you know, this is happening behind the scenes to buy up this land. And some of the land, for example, there's an industrial building just south of the Lowry Bridge on the West End that used to be Japs Olson Printing. That's owned by the Park Board. It still looks like an industrial, well, it still is an industrial building, and they just keep it as it is until they're ready to develop the park. But there are other pieces of land. There's a, um, a commercial building just south of Psycho Susie's on the other side that's also owned by the park board. But if you drove by, you would just see business. Right. You don't realize that they own that. So um, that's exciting, 80%, from 20% to 80%. So even though it's taken over 100 years, the last 19 years, there has been some progress. So. Oh, sure. And so if you just want to take a quick review over the handout I have here. Um, what I wanted to show you guys is that uh, the objectives that they stated um, in 2000 and 2019 are, are somewhat still relevant and very much kind of very similar to what Mary's already uh, mentioned. For example, the Grand Rounds uh, connecting to that. Uh, enhancing ecological functions of the river corridor, creating a system of river streets to link the adjacent neighborhoods, uh, public access to the river throughout a continuous system of riverfront parks, trails, and uh, establishing urban design guidelines for future development. Um, so all of that is still consistent. So I'd say that very much still is the same in, in that regard. Um, one thing that I would like to draw your attention to is the second uh, set of uh, bullet points. Uh, during the early Upper Harbor Terminal Community Engagement, uh, they enumerated the following characteristics of success. And I would really uh, ask, want us to ask really deeply uh, if we honestly think we are going to end up with these type of outcomes or results uh, through the engagement process and the, pro and the project model that's being put forward for us. And so I don't want to necessarily read these off to you, but I have time to kill, so I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, achieves equitable development and helps address disparities. It includes a, I love how it's worded. It says includes a first class regional park, kind of almost like a secondary thought. Connects into the fabric of the community, offers a significant riverfront oriented destination, provides high quality community benefiting private development, reflects the history of the site and incorporates high quality design, showcases green sustainable approaches and features, and feels unique to this specific place. So hopefully, no Chipotle is on the riverfront. Right. And I want to emphasize the connections with the neighborhoods. And this is something AFCAC has spent a lot of time on. So we're not just looking at the trails along the river, but how does this connect into the neighborhoods and all the way into parks and schools and things like that that might be pretty far from the river. And an example of this was, if you all know where Teleflask is, it's a science-based company that's just south of Plymouth um, on uh, West River Road. They're a Danish company, and when they, they, that's their United States headquarters. They moved it from Roseville or someplace, and because it's on the river, they're smart people. And it's a beautiful company. They have um, all kinds of artwork. By the way, they um, made an agreement to hire people from North Minneapolis, and they, have, they hired one person who didn't last, and they have no employees from North or from Northeast, as far as I know. None from North. But anyway, they wanted to close, somebody help me down, the name of the street. It comes off of 94 and goes all the way to the river. 18? 18? 18. They wanted to close that street, and the city agreed to, to give it to them. They have a term for that, which I can't remember. Vacation. Vacation. They, the the city like. agreed to vacate the street. Well, that's the only street that goes to the river between Plymouth and Broadway. That's right. And if you're coming off 94, to go to the river, it's to go see the, the boating shows or whatever. The river rides, right? It's the only way to get there without going all, all the, the way, way to Plymouth and Broadway, which has a lot of traffic. So we actually went to the people in Denmark and we said, listen, 
you're a smart company, you're very creative, pick a good spot, you're going to block the people from getting to the river if you vacate this street. And they changed the design of their building to keep that street open. They were very cooperative. The city was almost like, oh, really? Do they want to work with us? Yeah, this is important. Now, that road doesn't go straight to a neighborhood. It goes to 94. Correct. But it's still the same point, is we want streets that come in from the neighborhoods. There's a, devel there's a development um, closer to downtown. I can't remember the it's big, fancy, rich development. And they blocked, they vacated a street for that development. And if you live behind them, you have to go an extra block in either direction to get to the river. And it's walled off. They have a private development that's all walled off. That's actually against city policies. They have a policy to keep the grid open. So we push that policy, and it's going to come up with the Upper Harbor, too, is how are people going to get from the Upper Harbor into the neighborhoods? There may need to be a new bridge over 94, things like that, to, to um, keep these connected. So it's not just the river connections into the neighborhoods. And I appreciate Mary bringing that up about uh, maybe <laughs> there needs to be like a land bridge over 94. Um, MnDOT will be doing a, a construction project, should this be it, uh, to uh, increase the number of lanes on I-94 from 252 down to downtown Minneapolis so that there's a MnPass lane. And to be frank with you, I need to learn a little bit more about MnPass, but it, it definitely seems like uh, they're prioritizing folks that can spend a little bit more money to get back and forth between downtown and wherever their their neighbor is, their neighborhood is. But however, at the same time, uh, though they've also done a study in partnership with Metro Transit to look at bus rapid transit along the corridor and how they then uh, looking at several stations that would stop in North Minneapolis and that how they could connect people and provide just as good of service, for example, that they want to do with MenPass. However, they're proposing to build or do the reconstruction of the highway with none of these uh, considerations for bus rapid transit along the corridor, even though it showed that the corridor desperately needed it and it was feasible in terms of actually making it work. And so those, I think there's a community forum coming up on November 20th, shameless plug. Um, you should come to that as well. Uh, it's from five to seven and it'll take place at Farview Rec Center. Um, and that's incredibly important. It's connected to all the stuff that we're talking about today as well. Thank you for reminding me about that land, the yeah. land bridge. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the land bridge has been in the plan since the beginning. I think it was in one of the earlier plans as well. <laughs> and one of the plans actually calls for um, a waterfall coming across um, Lowry, right down here, and a way to take the um, stormwater and treat it. And then the waterfall would come down the bridge and go into the river. It's a really cool design. This is probably a little beyond what we're going to get, but there's some really good ideas in this plan. That was the that was the Lari uh, Lari uh, Avenue Community Works plan. Is that what that was? No, it was about. It's in above the falls. Okay. It's in above the falls. Yep. Other, I'm curious to know if people have any not questions, but also like comments that they want to make. I'm sure this is stirring up thoughts in people's minds of something similar. I'm surprised Georgiana hasn't brought up 26th Avenue North and how that's connecting to Theodore Worth all the way to the riverfront. Uh, Minneapolis Foundation or Parks Foundation has a million dollars to supposedly help leverage to build that thing. However, uh, they did a, a con the overlook, they, and they recently uh, employed some people to look at how much money that it would cost to actually construct that. Bids came back higher than anticipated, and so now supposedly they want to go back to the state and request three million dollars of state subsidy so they can help build that. And uh, but however, they funded another project south of there in Central Riverfront over in downtown Minneapolis, at least $15 million or so has gone into that project. They're, they're even requesting another $5 million for that project as well. And so you can, it's kind of interesting that Mary always points out, she's like, uh, many, uh, the Parks Foundation does some good work, but it, I wish they would actually give us more than just some crumbs up here. Yeah. So if you've got a thought or a question and you want to do that now, we've got an opportunity for a break. Raise your hand and we'll keep people up. We'll keep people up. Oh, the question was, I'm um, talking about creative 
uses of the, the wastewater and treating the wastewater um, at the Upper Harbor Terminal, and there are people looking at that, I don't think they're being particularly created. So we might want to push them. Like, I, and I'm just, now I'm just brainstorming. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, and that's kind of why we're doing this today, because we don't want this plan to die like all these other plans. Not that every word in here is great, or, you know, we even on the committee push back on some of the things in the plan. But for example, the housing. There is no housing on the west side of the river, and we pushed that. Pushed it and pushed it and pushed it, both with um, the, these developments, but also with zoning. And now we got housing in the plan, so we can change the plan as things change, as, as people's interests. But, um, you know, like maybe it could be a, wa a, wa a water fountain or a children's play area or something, not just clean it and put plants, which are great, but something creative that makes it fun down by the river. So. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Now, uh, if you put the house on the west <laughs> side of the river, mm -hmm. does that go up to uh, 94 to 94? How far would it What was the question? The question, the question is about housing and how far north it would go. Yeah. Um, how, far, how far west? Oh, shoot. How far, how, how far west? How far oh, west. to 94. It's going to 94. So it goes to, to the... Yep. 94 and down. Right now. It's all in flux. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say right now, in terms of the 48-acre site that they're looking at, potentially they're proposing looking at uh, Dowling and Washington Avenue as a site where they could put housing and then kind of continue that housing formation all the way down into even to the river, if you will. And so they're they're looking at some pretty high income levels. They're talking we're talking about like 30, uh, 50, 60, 80 percent AMI levels. When we're talking about uh, what type of like affordability levels of these of the housing. That, so that's uh, area median income, and that's not median income of the people that just live in North Minneapolis. That's like 16 county metro area type of deal. So we're talking about folks that live in like the Natrisca too. Go ahead. Yeah, it seems like we have uh, sufficiency of luxury <laughs> housing in Minneapolis and insufficiency of housing for working people and people who aspire to the middle class or to stay in the middle class. Actually, I think we're short on everything. That's what they're saying. So, uh, yeah, so David Luce was saying there's an abundance of luxury housing and maybe there needs to be some more workforce housing. What was your question, though, David? <laughs> Should there be more workforce housing? <laughs> It's all asked backwards, frankly. Yes. The plan needs, needed to come first from the community and not from uh, the developers Buildings. of downtown mm -hmm. in South Minneapolis. Are you and talking about the Upper Harbor Terminal plan or the Upper yes, Fall? Yes. All of the above. To that note, I think we are wanting to do a housing specific. One of these, like Sharetta and Dominican, put that on here. I know but that. above the fall, we <coughs> have. Some housing targets. Um, not, no, that. the above the falls plan didn't specifically talk about what kind of housing. But it, like I said, it was a fight just to get housing. Okay. Um, but it from the beginning talked about a thousand units. Okay. Um, but they weren't primarily on the west side, and we pushed for more. So, but now we're getting into the weeds of what kind of housing, how will it be subsidized? And I will. For people who don't know. On the west, on the east side of the Lowry Bridge, there's a new housing program going on with Common Bond. So um, that's housing on the river. And when we say on the river, we mean on the other side of the river road, not so you put your feet in the water. Because again, that's public space. So it's on the east side of Marshall Street and at Lowry, and it'll be on low income. And Proximity, proximity, proximity to the river is very big. And you remember sure. on the east side, you know, there's supposed to be a trail. Right. It should be really good. And that didn't happen. There was supposed to be a trail under the Lowry Bridge. That didn't happen. Not yet. It's still on the plan. But, and I learned some new words. It's continuous, contiguous, meaning it's continuous and it's next to the river. So, um, that's still on the plan. It's still going to happen, but it's all. That's why when we do the upper harbor terminal, we need to make sure that trail gets in because a lot of people don't see the finished product. They just see again. That's kind of why we're here. To see a piece. And Sharon, when Sharon Sales Belton was president, was president, was mayor. We've gone through a lot of mayors on this. <laughs> she said it's pearls on the river, and they need to be continuous. And the 
So it goes that far back, but that's still the point. And what? And, and habitat. And, yeah, and well, habitat, and right. Trail. Green space and trails. Yeah. Here, I think we had some um, some hands Questions? down here. Yeah. That were, you should be yourself in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Tom, did you? I, I, I thought I thought you might have looked at it. I was looking at the In there you got the, there were three alternatives. Which plan are you looking at? Two thousand four above the three. Wait. Uh, the thirteen? Twenty thirteen. Upper farm order twenty thirteen. That's the yes. Okay, and that's that's not above it overlaps. Okay. But that's not above the falls, that's up above the terminal. And we've been fighting on oh, some yes, issues. Your, your, your band is broader. Yeah. yeah. It's broader, but also just because the upper harbor terminal, somebody working on that came up with something doesn't mean it fits with the level. That's, that's so that's yeah. part of this. Yeah. There's a lot of pushback back and forth. Not 2004. They went through three alternatives of how you use it. Yes. But it was a village park, which primarily residential. Well, there have been many, many plans since 2004, probably 30. So there's been charrettes, there's been meetings, there was a thing by the FMR, there was the university has done a couple of studies and recommendations. Um, the, even the Upper Harbor Terminal CPC right now has gone through. So these are not plans, they were ideas that didn't get incorporated. So we still haven't decided where we're at. There's lots of ideas out there. So just for you know for teaching, I just this is a plan that's been accepted. Those are ideas to to add to the plan or to implement the plan. Yeah. So good question. And this is all in flux. So there's how many? Uh, just us three who are on the CPC. I guess we're deep knee deep in this right now discussing this. So feel free to come to the meeting and see. Yeah. He's been coming all the learning tables. Steve. Yeah. Steve's been coming all the learning tables. Yeah. yeah. I could be wrong, but I thought the so the question was, does anyone know about the orange line status of that and where they might be going with that? Uh, I could be wrong because I don't keep them all straight in my head in terms of like gold line, rush line, uh, orange line. But uh, is the orange line not the one that runs in South Minneapolis? That would uh, yeah, 35W corridor, and I know that they had to go, they had to fight tooth and nail to get some money to build uh, a station on basically at 35W, uh, so it could be like a nice interchange and place for people to connect there to, to get onto the bus rapid transit. And to my knowledge, that has been funded, and they either have already constructed that, and they'll be coming online. But I, that's a damn good question because that's something in my wheel box that I had followed at one time. And, and, and so, yeah, so uh, I, when I've had conversations with members of the Sierra Club, they were, I know that they have mentioned, for example, that they thought they had to fight really hard to get the, the investments for the Orange Line, kind of similar to what I had mentioned for uh, the corridor and the expansion of highway that's ha happening on I-94 from 252 to downtown. And so I think the, the, what they're trying to say is that now it's a similar battle where we need to speak up and fight hard to get another investment um, so this would be servicing, uh, it would have a station stop at Dowling, but there were some other stops that they looked at too. I think there were three particular stops that they looked at that were all located in North Minneapolis. Um, and they could, again, would add to the, the transit capacity that we currently have. Because if you look at the um, investment that we put in on Penn Avenue with the C line, that's really great. We have that bus driver transit online. Uh, could it be better? Probably, but at the same time, it is an improvement. And it was almost like a consolation prize for the route of the light rail 
going kind of skirting around Minneapolis and going from Olson Memorial Highway to 30, Theater Worth Parkway into Golden Valley up to Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center, for example. Um, and then what I want to say in addition to that is that I'm trying to get it right back on, try to get, try to get us back on track here. Uh, similar investments are happening on Emerson Fremont. Um, so the legislature actually funds it. We'll get more bus rapid transit that will serve North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis all the way to the, universe, uh, to the Mall of America. Um, but you're, you're pointing out something really crucial, which is on the uh, very far, far east side of North Minneapolis, basically Lindale Avenue, where the 22 runs. Uh, the, the street itself needs to be reconstructed really badly. The surface of the 22 obviously could be upgraded to be, have better service, similar to what we're doing on the other corridors there in North Minneapolis. And I think that this uh, in, uh, expansion on the highway provides us at least one opportunity to help provide an option, transit option, to people that are close by that corridor. And it all fits into how do we get people not only um, to our riverfronts, uh, but also, as Mary said, connecting us to our neighborhoods, our schools, and our parks. Um, and so, above the falls, we've had some great at land acquisitions with from basically from Plymouth Avenue up to like 22nd, where the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad Yard is. Uh, um, Continental, uh, they're a cement company that exists right beyond them. They're one of the, I think they're one of the linchpins in terms of getting better access and that contiguous trail that we need um, from Ole Olson Park up to 26th Avenue Overlook. Sound, right? Sound about right? And just to open up the discussion to a broader, some broader issues, on both sides of the river through Minneapolis, it's the Great River Road. And again, on the west side of the river here, there isn't a continuous road. So hopefully when the West River Road is done, I have, I'm hopeful, that will also be marked as the Great River Road. You can go all the way from northern Minnesota to New Orleans on that road. Also, it's the, it's the Mississippi River Trail. Have any of you heard of that? It's the first and only um, cross-country bike trail. It goes from Lake Itasca to New Orleans. There are only two spots in Minnesota that are not marked. One is a little stretch in southeast Minnesota, and the other one is right here. Because Hennepin, it's a Hennepin County road, and they refuse to mark it until it's safe. So we're looking at bike trails on Marshall Street. We're going to take the parking off on the west side of the street. That's already basically the plan. We've got a million community meetings. But we're waiting for it to move up into the money, the money piece. And then again, this West River Road on the west side, as it's constructed, will also be marked as the uh, Mississippi River Trail. If you look it up online, it's really exciting. You can find your way. All, sometimes it goes along the river, sometimes it's on city roads, sometimes it's in the country. But people are, we're getting, you know, when you hear about these long trails, like the Appalachian Trail, <laughs> people will be traveling this route. I've noticed more people on Marshall Street. Mm -hmm. They'll be doing the whole route, they'll be doing two or three days, and they'll be staying at hotels, they'll be eating at restaurants, they'll be camping, they'll be going to a Twins game. And it's a really exciting piece to have coming right through our neighborhoods, the National Trail. And then also, for people who don't know, this stretch is included in the Mississippi National River Recreation Area, which is a national park. Mm -hmm. So we also have a national park coming right through our neighborhood. It's really cool. So with, and they do programming. They take the kids out on boats. And a lot of people aren't connected to these resources. So. That's true. And businesses that are along the Mississippi River Trail can get money to advertise their businesses. So you don't, and you don't have to be right on the trail. But if you have a bar, or a restaurant, whatever, and you want people to come down the trail and stop in at your spot, you can advertise on the on the internet. And so these are opportunities for people that a lot of us aren't aware of. Mary, what about more marking for the Red River Oscar? And the Red, well, going back to the native culture, um, this I believe uh, Marshall Street more because you couldn't come down the west side because of uh, rapids and things, but. The Native Americans and then later the settlers and the explorers came across the Cahoon Rapids Dam and came down the east side of the river um, around Broadway. They went over to what's today University Avenue and then went to St. Paul. And that was the oldest or the second oldest road traveling route in the state of Minnesota. It went all the way up into Canada. And then people took their, their whatever and went wherever they went on the river and other rivers. So um, that's the Red River Oxcart Trail as well. So very historic travel routes through here. Very historic travel routes. People didn't stay in this area. 
we looked for history for a while. The history of this area is everybody was going downtown. <laughs> In the old days, it was Spirit Island. Now it's downtown. But this was really a, an area where people traveled through, which is significant. Which of the many, many years of plans for the river and for the Upper Harbor Terminal would have the Upper Harbor Terminal in the most acres part of the space trail nature for the Upper Harbor Terminal site? Which plan? Oh, had those extra. Uh, the 2013 Above the Falls Mas uh, Regional Park Master Plan recalled for 28 acres. 28. That's correct, yep. Of, of a park, public park, but. Um, two, quick mm -hmm. two places I've worked on MRT in North Minneapolis and southeastern Minnesota. It's like a mile in southeastern Minnesota. And I guess the other thing, and for those of you who have been here now for certain conversations, um, one thing that National Park Service um, emphasized was the amount of community engagement that went into their planning and um, how that was grassroots <coughs> up to the Fed level. Mm -hmm. Do you all have, this is a two-part question, an idea of how many hours, how many people, how many decades have gone into above the falls planning? And how do we talk with our government agencies to hold that and not let short term or new plans usurp all that work? What can we do? What can we do to hold this stuff, if we like? Assuming we do, because mm -hmm. so many hours are in my recollection of the original above the fall plan was that it was many years and many meetings that were very well attended. Um, it's in the back of the original. I don't have the original booklet. Um, now, somebody else might have a different memory of that. I just know I was at a lot of really big meetings. Wait, well, how many people in this room were part of anything about the policy? 95 to 2000. Oh, no, not that. Okay. So, 95. Which is 2000, then AFCAC. And then AFCAC's been involved for 19. But the Evolving Falls Community Advisory Committee, I think, has got to be the longest continuously running CAC in the city. Probably. And for some reason, back in the day, uh, well, let me just say a little bit about that. So AFCAC took about a year to develop with all kinds of people involved, including neighborhoods. And it's one third neighborhoods with representatives chosen by the neighborhood. So we are not chosen by the city council. The neighborhood chooses the rivers along the rivers, neighborhoods along the river choose representatives. Then we have what we call non-contiguous, I love that word, north north neighborhoods and non-contiguous northeast. They have two reps each. Um, and then we have business reps and environmental reps who are chosen by the businesses and chosen by the environmental groups. So the city council does not have weigh in at all. That's a little different right now. So it's an interesting group, and we make all decisions by consensus, and we have done that for 19 years. Um, the Isaacs used to be on APCAC, and it was a real interesting time for consensus, but we did it. And it's interesting when you get environmental, business, and neighborhoods, and neighborhoods have different you know, priorities. Mm -hmm. So we make all decisions by consensus, and we, have, we, sit, we vote if we can't do it, but we have never voted, and I think that's amazing. And we still like each other and talk to each other and show up. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So we meet on the last Tuesday of the month, not the fourth, the last, sometimes the fourth, sometimes the fifth, at the park board meeting building from seven to nine. Pretty good about staying on track. So if you're interested, and the other thing we did that was really, and I say we, it's, it was a big group, is there's a, a rep from each of those groups, there's an alternate and a second alternate. There are 90 seats on that. If you, if you can't find a seat, you're not trying hard enough. And that's because we didn't want anybody to be turned away. Mm -hmm. So there are 90 seats. Mm -hmm. So you can come and, and, and there's some neighborhoods that are not represented right now, which is a lot, shame. A lot, yeah. Sheridan is not, uh, St. Anthony West, um, Sheridan, Sheridan, Camden, Camden, near Newark, Newark, Camden, 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 I mean, just a lot of people who haven't been showing up. So Lynn Bohannon, Hawthorne, McKinley now. Yeah. Yeah. Hawthorne's rep represented. Oh yeah, but, I'm sorry. I'm if, you're that. Interested, <laughs> if you're interested, and again, we don't make a big deal. Everybody's welcome at the table. Everybody's welcome to participate. We rarely even go to consensus. We usually just discuss. So you're very welcome to participate. So did did um, 
In developing the content plan for UHT, A, did the decision makers, planners, idea makers consult with AFCAC? And or how does the current concept plan meet with these primary objectives? Of both I'll plans? answer the first part. Okay. Again, AFCAC's in a unique position. Um, we represent the above the falls. Okay, so we represent the whole project and a couple, and amongst ourselves, mm -hmm. Some of our goals are to keep the whole picture. Mm -hmm. An example in the early days was every neighborhood wanted a boat dock. Every, everybody wanted a boat dock. Well, you can't have 10 boat docks on the upper river. That's just mm -hmm. not going to work. So maybe there'll be two boat docks, and we'll decide as a group which area is the best suited for. It. So you can't, we don't fight for our own neighborhood. We bring our neighborhood's perspective, but we're really focused on the whole river, both sides and all the way up and down. So. We, but, but then each individual project has its own CAC. So the Sheridan development had its own CAC. Upper Harbor Terminal has its own CAC. Two CACs, actually. But then AFCAC is like an overarching CAC. For example, we're going to co-host with the Park Board an open house on December 3rd, probably. We, we may. We're, we don't, I talked to, I talked to, um, uh, to Kate today, and uh, the city didn't want to come. The city didn't want to be a presenter. They didn't want to talk about certain items about the concept plan. So I don't know if we're going to still do it. Okay. Well, we're in discussion anyway. And we've done other open houses. So we don't necessarily agree with the city of the park board on everything, but we still co-host. So we bring in people. We help structure the meeting. We have our meeting afterwards. And so we work collaboratively with the city and the park board on the whole river and, and also on the smaller projects to some degree. But there might be a specific CAC for the smaller projects. And to answer the second part of the question, similar to other city, uh, city uh, community advisory committees, we did respond to concept plan earlier this year prior to it being approved in March. Uh, and we shared a number of concerns. They're very similar to what some folks heard from like the National Park Service, for example. Um, I know, for example, um, the boundary of the, um, the roadway, for example, was a, a great concern. We talked about how um, private development and basically uh, folks that were looking to profit off of this pro project really needed to be considerate of community benefit agreements and needs that could go into it. Uh, and so we did write a letter that basically said, we have these concerns, you should be addressing those things. Um, and so, like I said, the National Park Service, some other uh, tacks that are belong to the city, like the, the Help me out here, Colleen. What are the other tax that of the city that uh, did letters that showed their disapproval with the concept plan prior to March's approval? Official committees? Yeah, from the city. I'm not sure. Okay. Because I know there was an environment. There were a lot of letters. Yeah, there was an yeah. Yeah. environment. Yeah, it's the yeah. Community yeah. Environmental Advisory Committee okay. that wrote a letter. Yeah. So just like. And in some neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there was a number of people that basically weighed in and said, city, please reconsider this concept plan. And then the city delay. Or, and delay it. And then also, what's that mean? When they did delay the vote a couple of times, but then essentially they you know, went forward with their concept plan with some amendments, created a couple of CACs to help rubber stamp what they wanted to happen. And here we are today talking about it. Any questions, ideas? And also people that came in a little later to maybe want to introduce or take this moment to reflect back about what you're conversation surprise you, intrigue you, you know, what direction do we want to go for the next 15 minutes? Okay. Okay. One, two, go. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm new to the conversation. Uh, my name is Christina. I live in South Valley. And um, I had a couple, I don't, I don't know if there's a short answer to either of these things, but like one of the things that we're just discussing is um, our relationship with, uh, or CAC's relationships with the state and with the National Park Services. Yeah. So what um, what responsibility do they have to respond to us? Like what sort of checks and balances, like do they have to respond to us? Or like what are what are the levers, what are our, what are, what are our superpowers with CAC's? Yeah, you know? that's like, a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Which, 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 it kind of ties into what can we be doing things. Yeah. Um, I don't really understand that relationship. And the other was, um, the top bullet point on the UHT says it helps with address disparities. Are those disparities, those particular disparities listed somewhere? Uh, like what disparities yeah, are we're, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, that's a really good. That's a really good question too, because I think a lot of times, like we come up with these lists of things that we'd like that sound lofty, like lofty goals and stuff like that. And I don't know if we actually drill down to say like um, what exactly disparities. I know anti-displacement strategies and uh, gentrification, uh, kind of like things we can do to prevent them. I know that was very clearly stated when they passed the concept plan and had some amendments with it. So I can say that with confidence that's something that they they thought that should be. Um, considered with this plan, whether or not the plan actually addresses that first bullet point is the question that I would pose to all of you and I would, and my response would be to you, no, it certainly does not. Um, but then the first question that you asked in terms of the, the superpowers that we have, the superpowers are really, are great in the sense that like if you're a really active person that's persistent and you wanna keep on going to meetings and you wanna have your voice heard uh, and you're not gonna be weighed down um, by the fact that like you have to come at ridiculous, you know, it's just like, it's like any other meeting and some of them are held after work, some of them are held during your work hours. And so um, in this case, for example, what I remember doing clearly with AFCAC, so I remember uh, previously the city of Minneapolis wanted to put a, a maintenance facilities uh, location at 1702 Marshall Street, Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, the CAC and I helped uh, write a letter to the city, very similar to what we did with the upper terminal, terminal concept plan. Uh, and then what we did is when we sent that letter to all the council members and the park and the park people and the mayor for example we then followed up and went to a park board meeting uh where it was like basically a public hearing and we uh made sure that we brought a copies of all of the letter that we sent to them so that again those for public record uh and then we came as a group so maybe like two or three of us for example came up to the microphone and very much knew what the other person was going to say so we kind of tag team it if you will and present the information that essentially is already in the letter but again you're saying it out loud for the public to be put on public record and then sometimes you have to do that multiple times because now with the concept plan and the above the falls uh, boundary line for example this month uh kate will be going back to uh the park board for example to get this approved and it's looking like november 20th for example might be that date so that'd be a good and a prime time for everyone to show up i know for example myself mary Georgiana and Susan and whoever else wants to show up and be a part of that will come and, and present as we've done in the past. The city, it was like CPED staff will be there. They were there before when they decided to kind of delay it and figure out what was going to happen with the park space. Even though the acres state remained the same, the location of the music venue is being proposed further south. And so things are evolving. But in terms of like, are we actually going to see these outcomes that we have listed here in terms of characteristics of success? I mean, I, I would. Colleen shared with us more recently this year uh, a map that showed um, in, uh, sorry, property values that were increasing to the, like, tw like, uh, like a 25% in 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 increase uh, compared to like other neighborhoods, for example. And those are in like the McKinley neighborhood and surrounding the Upper Harbor Terminal Project. And so like stuff is occurring very much in terms of like people potentially getting pushed out. Um, but not everybody is aware of how uh, imminent all this stuff really is. The neighborhoods cool. right around Upper Harbor Terminal saw the highest percentage in housing value increase in 2019 out of any place in the city. Thank you. I think Actually, so. we, have, in we do have to be careful because I have a house in that area. It's not just the Upper Harbor Terminal, which probably yeah. has some there's, influence. There's a lot of courses. But there's other. Yeah. And one thing is this area has been relatively cheap, and people can't afford the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. And there's actually just outside people, investors, Trip. coming in and buying up our cheaper houses, yeah. which raises the price. Yeah. So there's a lot of factors, yep. but yeah, so related to that, some of us, especially on the CPC, are looking at other things we can do, like protecting people um, from not paying higher property tax if they've been in the house a certain amount of time. And so there's a lot going on with that. But I want to go back to the um, program. CAC. Okay. Well, the power of the CAC. The power of the CAC. <laughs> Anytime you've got a group, as opposed to just being by yourself, you're going to have more power. And so if the CAC is organized, and kind of the stuff that Alexis is talking about, writes the letter, shows up at the meeting, has a clear position. One of the things that frustrates me is when people come in and say what they don't want, but they don't say what they do want. That's good, really and fun. people don't know what to do when you say, I don't want prices to go up. Okay, what do you want? You know, <laughs> How are we going to get there? So if you want to reduce property tax for people, blah, 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 it's complicated. Say that as opposed to just saying, you know, whatever. Um, the other thing is to, to, we do a lot of collaboration. So on the 1702 Marshall, we work with the neighborhood. And if you're in agreement, and we were, then you're really powerful. Because right. the people living there 
there were people living across the street from that development that didn't know about it. That's right. So then they, they come to the meeting and say, whoa, there's going to be, I'm making this up now, but there's going to be 60 trucks a day pulling in in front of my house? Are you kidding me? That's not going to work. And that's powerful because then you have that personal perspective as well. And the National Park Service and Friends of the Mississippi River, when everybody's on the same page, sure, we get fun. things done. Yeah. When we don't agree, it's a little harder. But find points of agreement and let people know. It really does make a difference. And if you know about things like the Above the Falls plan, they agreed to this. So you can say, and by the way, the developers know that. They go to the planning commission, and I have seen developers say, this agrees with the Above the Falls plan because on page 42 it says, they take it out of context, and it's not true. And then we have to go in and say, whoa, 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 read the whole paragraph. This project does not fit the Above the Falls plan because they're obligated to follow this plan or at least say why they're not, and the other plans. There's other, and for example, what this gentleman brought up is not a plan. You can say we discussed it, people liked it, but it's not agreed to. Once it's agreed to, then they have to pay some attention. Tom, over here, I think I said now we're Sure, yeah. I'll come in. Are you going to call? I will. I'll do it. It'll be a bit. development on Lowry on the northeast side, they took out two two houses that were natural, what do they call it? Natural occurring affordable housing. Natural occurring affordable housing. Two large lots, and so it's a block long. They put in 40 apartment townhouse type units, and they're renting, they built four bedroom units with four bathrooms, small living room and dining room, and a tiny rooftop deck. And the rent is, $4,000 a month. $4,000. This is one apartment. No, they're not. No, they're not. It's four bedrooms, one unit, $4,000 a month. And it was one house. And they're getting four times $20,000, $80,000 a month. They took out one house. And this is what the 2040 plan allows. Right. So somewhere along the line, the 2040 plan has to be addressed by people that are helping Okay, here's your challenge. This is being developed by the city, which supports the 2040 plan. It's the rules. Well, it's not incorporated. It is incorporated. It is. It overlays. Well, absolutely. I'm with Tom. No, I'm not 
not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying it's already been done. We need to have our heads up about how that's going to get implemented. I think that's what Tom's really getting at, having our heads up about how that's yeah. implemented. I think that's exactly what he's saying. We need to have, uh, Lowry, Lowry, Lowry. Second Street and Lowry, go and look at it. South of Lowry on Second Street, it's scary. Oh, and they're, they're rented. They're all rented. I don't know how they did it. What? The townhomes. Yeah, townhomes, and they go all the way around. Yeah. 4000 a month. And they're all rented. The liquor store's gone. The liquor store's gone. across the street. Yeah. yeah. So we're in our last couple of minutes. Um, no, 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 just with the video. And then, and then we can talk amongst yeah, ourselves. Yeah, but while this is a targeted thing, before people start leaving, we do have a um, uh, put your bubbles on your top three priorities before you do go. So I'm going to catch you on doing that. But um, David has a question. Yeah. Yep. And keep amongst yourselves. I'm just saying that this part is going to yeah. um, sure. sign up at 6 30. So, um, people talk about and think about the uh, increase in housing values for residential housing and commercial housing. But I don't know that people have had a real in depth conversation about how priceless the river front is, the land on the river, and all the implications of how that land is used. Uh, how, yeah. inv how invaluable the land is, and that uh, uh, how in the, in the, in the uses that are on there are it's really critical that they're actually. I, you didn't say this, David, but I think what David's really trying to say is that the uses of that land are really are beneficial. That actually have some good some good uses. There's times, for example, along West River Parkway where you see storage storage facilities that are built along the parkway, and it's obviously that's not a great use of space. And that's the challenge with this development is to have enough public use, public access. And I don't know if I invented this, but I've started to use a term called quasi-public, like a restaurant is quasi-public because everybody can go in it. Theoretically, you can use the bathrooms. You know, you can walk through their area. It's not a private use, even though it's privately owned. And so along the river and land does, and this is a, stress point right now with the upper river terminal is ideally the developments that are along so you have the river road so you have the public access which most of us think should be bigger and then on the what on the opposite side of the road have uh, river related uses now what does that mean could be boat rentals could be bike rentals could be restaurants could be um even boat building facilities like um, the, the urban boat builders that builds boats with kids um, and then we get into things that may or may not be river related, like a school that uses the river for some of their education, or a museum that has some, you know, that type of thing. But it's definitely not a factory or private housing that, that precludes people from using the public area. And this gets really tricky. And, and is it gentrification? What, what's happening? And how do we protect the neighborhoods? And how do we protect people's, you don't want your really, property really back. It really is a question of how can it's how can somebody justify taking public land out of the public domain? And why isn't the public um, why doesn't the public have to say over whether they're willing to give up public land? Well, when you say public land, what does that mean? City, oh, city owned land. Acres of public land, city owned land on our side of the river, in our neighborhood. That's getting sold off United Properties. And they're saying, well, you can have so much for a park, mm -hmm. so much is going to be private development. The mayor, the mayor, the, the mayor and CPAT apparently. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not right. And that's precedent setting or no? Well, we don't. Up this project from the We've never had this much of the land yet owned by the city. It's a unique opportunity. I mean, the city owns a lot of land in the city, and the public access to that. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, yet, <coughs> yeah. but I, I don't think the city would agree that it's land for the for, for taking. They feel like they need to get taxes from it. They need to sell, even to the park board, they sell it to the park board. They don't just give it, to, you know, there's these deals back there. Yeah, so there's a deal with Drake, and that wasn't right. something right either. Well, that was one of the worst deals. We have time, we can talk about that. Yeah, that was a long